Hello, today we shall be answering some deceptively difficult questions that are rather very simple such as what is a photon? Is it a particle or a wave? How can a single photon form an interference pattern and so on? Let's start by understanding how light is produced. Imagine a charged particle in space. It could be an electron or a proton or any charged body at all. Around this charged particle are what we call field lines, precisely electric field lines. I need you to note that physicists don't exactly what field lines are, physically, but for sure it is a property of space induced by the presence of a charged particle. If you are not a novice in physics, then you should know that the strength of these field lines decreases with distance from the charge. That is, it is a function of distance. If you bring another charged particle closer to this one, it will experience a force. Imagine now that you move this main charge up and down in a sinusoidal manner. What do you think will happen to the other charge? You guessed it, it will also move in a similar manner, which means it is receiving a signal from the other charged particle and this signal it's just a changing magnetic field strength. Maxwell's equations tell us that a changing electric field produces a corresponding magnetic field that propagates perpendicular to it. Therefore, by moving this charge up and down, we create these two changing fields which are what we jointly call electromagnetic waves, or you could say light. Let me digress. We started with an electric field, which is a, I can say, property of space, and it gave us light, meaning that light also is related to space in some way. Think about it. Therefore, light is a disturbance of space caused by vibrating charges. I would think that you can perform this experiment with a massive object to get gravitational waves from gravitational field lines. Do you see how this explanation of light production resembles what you get on a water surface by moving an object up and down that surface? If we oscillated the charged particle for say one second, then we will have a wave propagate out as a pulse that is one second long. I used one second because it makes the explanation easier and this is what I shall be using throughout this video. The frequency of this pulse will clearly be equal to the frequency of the vibrating charge. Let's say after the pulse is produced, you wait another one second before producing another one, and so on. If you continued in this manner, what you would end up with is a stream of pulses. Now, place a detector on the other end to detect these pulses. What will it record? What it will record is discrete chunks of energy surges of equal magnitude hitting it at a frequency of 1 Hz. If one pulse carries an energy, say E, then after some time T, the total energy recorded will be equal to MME, where N is the total number of pulses that reach the detector. Let's say you decide to have some more fun by creating pulses of different frequencies. What do you have to do to achieve that? Well, that's easy. You simply cause the charge to oscillate either faster or slower. Since all pulses are produced for a duration of one second, it means that those with higher frequencies will inevitably have greater number of cycles within than those produced at lower frequencies. Since the amplitude of the oscillator is unchanged, then pulses with higher frequencies will have more energy than those with low frequencies. These pulses are what we call photons, and a stream of these photons is what we see as light. Please note that these pulses are produced in all directions and not necessarily in the order in which I have presented. The different frequencies of the different photons correspond to different colors of light, 
and they all have different amounts of energy. Those with higher frequencies are bluer, while those with lower frequencies are redder. If you play around with this charged particle so much that you have all the different frequencies of the, of the visible spectrum, then what you would have produced is white light. Pass this white light through a prism, and since different photons have different frequencies, they will be refracted differently. Hence, you will have a separation of the colors. A common place where this phenomenon occurs naturally is an atom. Think of an atom as two balls connected by a spring. One ball way massive than the other. Since atoms generally have more than one electron, you can add other springs as you like, but these springs must be of different lengths to correspond to the different orbital radii. Hence, each spring particle will have its own natural frequency. If you give energy to the spring to extend or compress and leave the system to oscillate, it will do so at its natural frequency. And since the particles on these springs are charged, they will produce EM waves of that frequency. This is an analogy of the excitation and the excitation of atoms to produce EM waves. We have different springs, therefore, the light propagating from this atom will comprise of many different photons, just like I explained earlier in the water ripple example. Point to note. A photon is a pulse of EM waves. EM radiations are made of a bunch of photons. Let us now look at the weird quantum effect of interference of a single photon and see how weird it is. What happens when you pass a monochromatic light through a double slate? You get an interference pattern of bright and dark bands forming on the screen. This is purely wave-like behavior. You get the same interference pattern regardless of whether you shine the light continuously or a single photon at a time. In quantum mechanics, a photon is regarded as a particle, so the question arises, how can a single particle go through both slits and interfere with itself? And they make this sound like a very big problem. The confusion arises from the way the problem is phrased. Here, the assumption of the wave-like nature of light treats the light beam like a continuous wave that goes through the double slit and forms the interference pattern, forgetting that that beam is not continuous, but rather made of short identical pulses. This beam is a stream of discrete photons, not one long wave. Do not forget that each of these photons or pulses are themselves waves. So the beam going through the double slit is identical to individual photons going through the slit and dispersing, forming the interference pattern. So it doesn't matter whether you send the photons all at once as a continuous beam or one by one. You will still get the same interference pattern. That is not strange at all. So, does that mean that a photon is not a particle? Well, yes. But when you detect it, it may have effects similar to those of particles. But that is not to say that it is a particle. What is an example of this? Do you still remember how we produce those electromagnetic pulses in intervals of one second? Well, if you placed a detector to detect these pulses, it will detect them in a way not different from the way it will detect a stream of electrons emitted at same intervals. This description is con consistent with the photoelectric effect. Imagine shining a bunch of photons onto a metal surface. Those photons randomly hit the electrons of the atoms of that surface. If a pulse or photon strikes an electron, it causes the electron to vibrate at its frequency, therefore reproducing the same frequency. That is, the electron absorbs and re-emits the wave. Just remember our spring analogy of the atom. 
If the frequency of the photon is less than the resonance frequency of the electron, then very little could be done to the electron. But if the frequency is equal to or higher than the natural frequency, then the electron will be severed from the atom. That's how higher frequency waves are able to disperse electrons from atoms. You could also achieve this by increasing the amplitude of the photons. But photons amplitudes are more or less constant. So the only other option is to increase the frequency. That's why when you apply the amplitude energy relation to explain the photoelectric effect, you fail. This is also analogous to shaking of fruits from a tree. You either shake rigorously or at a high frequency matching the resonance frequency of the fruits. That's all I have for you today. Please subscribe for other videos. Thanks for watching.